Now the champion marched for forty days, saying, Give me a man to fight. The Israelites said, We got a brave heart, but our feet are sort of full of fright. Then a boy with a sling, a pocket full of rocks, that knew how to trust and pray, said, If you're going to run, Goliath, you might as well take off now, because I came here to stay. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. When I fall down, I'm going to get her right up. Didn't start out to play. It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Run if you want to, run if you will. I came here to stay. Now the decree had been signed by the hand of the king. Daniel still prayed to the Lord. The hungry lions pacing the den. Here comes supper, one roared. And if you'd have been standing anywhere close, you'd have heard Brother Daniel say, If you're talking about me, forget it, boys. I came in here to stay. Run if you want to, run if you will. I came here to stay. When I fall down, I'm going to get right up. Hello, Jeff Dollar here. And back on November 2nd, 1982, I remember driving home from work in Hammond, Indiana. I lived on Summer Street in Hammond and having the radio on, as I, as I normally did listening to the news, hearing the, the story that uh, Lester Roloff had died in a plane crash. I remember weeping uh, over that, that he had, he had been, been killed. Now, I did not know Lester Roloff personally. Lester Roloff was one that I had heard preach several times uh, at, at First Baptist Church in the pastor's school uh, in Hiles Anderson College. I heard many things about him. Uh, so he was not a personal friend, but he was somebody that I had come to know through the preaching of Jack Hiles and hearing him. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I enjoyed hearing him, and, and I looked up to him as a, as a fundamentalist. And when I heard that he had died, it, it broke my heart. Uh, but uh, uh, that, but not really knowing him personally, it was more of a uh, he, his persona uh, that I had had come to to to, to love. Uh, so, uh, what I like to look at is this idea of fundamentalism itself. You know the uh, what makes up a true fundamentalist. Now, uh, what I, what I'm going to do is show that the new IFB. That those that claim to be independent fundamental Baptists are not fundamentalists at all, regard whatever they may be. They're not true fundamentalists. They may hold on to the same preaching style as some fundamentalists, such as Billy Sunday or, or uh, Bob Jones Sr. or Lester Roloff. They may have some of the antics. They may uh, preach the same way, but they are very, very different doctrinally. And doctrine, and doctrine is where it really matters, because that's the, that was the very essence of fundamentalism. A final mes- fundamentalism came out of liberalism back in the uh, late, latter 19th, early 20th century, and that what distinguished them from the the liberals of the world was their doctrine, their, their adherence to the fundamental doctrines of the faith. Now, what I'm going to show you here is that the new IFB. It does not hold to these major doctrines of the faith. So either they are going into liberalism or they're something outside of fundamentalism, which is actually uh, would be closer to a modern cult than what it would be actual fundamentalism. You know, if you are a, an independent fundamental Baptist, as I was, you know, you may be attracted by the things which are on the outside, that which is which appears to to be. Uh, orthodox, or it begin, which appears to be f- true fundamentalism, you know, the, the hard preaching, the willing to take a stand, uh, the the loudness of the service, you know, the excitement of the service, the music, and you know, all of these things 
uh, we tend to, to gravitate to, oh, this, is, this is, must be a real church because it's just like uh, this other church I was in, rather than looking at the, the core details. That's what we'd like to look at today it is, is this movement a true fundamentalist movement? And can it be a fundamentalist movement if it denies and opposes the actual doctrines that made up fundamentalism? You know, the old fundamentalist movement, I'm talking that which is outside of Jack Hiles. Jack Hiles started something new. Uh, Jack Hiles, when he began to preach certain things, deviated from the fundamentals of the faith. Now, the, the old fundamentalism, which, which existed apart from Jack Hiles, was quite different doctrinally. Hiles was the, the pioneer in leading the old fundamentalists out of actually fundamentalism into something else. I would be in agreement with those who would like to reform fundamentalism, who see the fundamentalism of, of some people that's very shallow and try to make it uh, more scholarly, would try to be more accurate in their doctrine, uh, would do some reading outside of the box, to go back to some of the old Puritan writers and, reader, and, and read some of their writings, uh, to, to go back and uh, to, to read some of the more sound people uh, the, the preachers of, of the past. But what happens when you do that is it, it leads you out of fundamentalism. You can't tolerate the shallowness anymore that's tolerated within it. So it's kind of in a conundrum. You know, what's happened here in fundamentalism is that you have a real need of reformation within fundamentalism. And you have a person like a Stephen Anderson who decides he's going to remake fundamentalism and remake it in the image of Jack Hiles. Now the problem with that is they're not going back to the fundamentals of the faith. They're not going back to these original men who had written the fundamentals in order to try to preserve orthodox doctrine within these groups. But they are following one who had left fundamentalism, that is Jack Hiles, and his doctrinal deviations. So they're, they follow that and they're then going further than what Jack Hiles went and actually completely destroying fundamentalism. We're going to show here in this video how that that has occurred. Sin. So what the doctrine of original sin is teaching is that we're punished for Adam's sin, for his transgression in the Garden of uh, Eden. When he transgressed against God, God is holding that on our account, and that means that we're being punished for what he did, which makes totally no sense. But this is a doctrine that's preached in the pro in many it all Protestants. Stems as a result from a false belief on what original sin is, thinking that um, we, as as soon as you're born as a baby, or maybe even prior to that, I'm not sure, depending on what people believe. But but when you're conceived, when you become a person, that you are inherently a sinner because of Adam's transgression. And again, that's that leads people to do this. My first response to that. I don't believe in the original sin doctrine. And, and let me just explain that because a lot of people are confused about what original sin means. Obviously, I believe that because Adam sinned, we are all sinners and our that sin nature has been passed on to all of us. Okay, so we're all born with a sinful nature, of course. But what original sin teaches is that God will basically punish us for what Adam sinned. Even if we don't have our own sins, he'll punish us for Adam's sin. And why this is so just like Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and they were in a state of innocence and they did not know that they were naked, also little children that are one, two, three, four years old, maybe even five years old sometimes, they have no clue that they're naked. They'll run around the house naked and they don't even care because they're still in that state of innocence. God. So we see very clearly that when they say original sin, they don't mean what you thought that they meant. If you say, well, that's a biblical doctrine. No, no, no. They're not saying that you have a sin nature. They're saying you are held responsible for Adam's sin, and we got to get rid of that through baby baptism. It's garbage. It makes perfect it. sense when you understand the biblical doctrine that's taught in many other places that those who die in their mother's womb go straight to heaven, and those who are a young child, newborn baby go to heaven as well. It makes sense because they're alive spiritually. It makes sense that their name's in the book of life. It makes sense that they are one who is uh, under grace. Because, and really, they haven't done anything wrong at that point. They're a baby. They're a newborn. They're an infant. But not a 
Let me say first off that the purpose of this video isn't to refute these things doctrinally. Uh, that would take quite a while and I've done that in some other videos. But the purpose of this video is to simply point out that these deviations exist. And this deviation is in the area of original sin. Now one of the authors of the fundamentals uh, wrote of original sin. His name was Thomas Whitelaw and he had this to say of the biblical conception of sin. Upon his descendants, as Adam's descendants, it opened up the floodgates of corruption by which their natures, even from birth, fell beneath the power of evil. Now, the new IFB would agree with that part of it. This is what the theologians call the doctrine of original sin, by which they mean that the results of Adam's sin, both legal and moral, have been transmitted to Adam's posterity so that now each individual comes into the world not like his first father in a state of moral equilibrium but as the inheritor of a nature that has been weakened by sin now there's something in there that I think we need to point out that, that yes they do agree with the corruption that comes from Adam but there's a word here where he mentions the word both legal and moral that Adam's uh, fall was not just something that occurred by accident. Adam was a representative. He was called the federal head of the race. So anything that happens in Adam is going to affect the entire race, all of his posterity. Now, Adam's fall brought the race into actual condemnation and actual guilt so that we are legally responsible before God for Adam's sin because he was our representative. Now, that's the concept of... of of representation of a federal head that he was the head of the race Amen. this is important because when you get into Romans and it talks about Christ as the head of the race of the, of the believer that you have the new Adam or he is the new representative and so we see this concept Christ is coming to repair replace uh, what had occurred under Adam so if we're in Adam we die if we're in Christ, we're made alive. So you see that we're either in one or in the other. We're all born in Adam. We're all born in condemnation. Uh, if we're not in Christ, we remain there. Uh, so that, that's the concept that of original sin, that that guilt and that actual legal guilt is there. If the new IFB denies that, they've deviated from the fundamentals of the faith. Get into it. Number one, you cannot repent of all your sins. You right. cannot repent of all your sins. It is impossible. Right. A lot of times when somebody says, well, you have to repent of your sins, I'll say, well, which ones? Right. Well, I mean, do you, drinking. Okay, what else? You know, do you have to repent of all your sins? And in their mind, you know, they have this balance of little sins, big sins. Hey, Jesus died for all the sins, right. and it's impossible for us to stop sinning completely. It's totally impossible. Yeah, right. so, so those on the outside looking in, the people that teach you have to turn from sin to be saved point at us and say, you're saying that grace means you can stay in sin. I'm saying we need grace because I can't get out of sin. It's foolishness. And again, it all goes back to how you define repentance. And again, they're talking about cleaning the outside of the cup. And what did Jesus say? Hey, get the inside clean first, then deal with the outside. And that's why once you're saved, sure, then you should clean up your life. If you don't, you're still going to heaven. But the doctrine that you've got to repent of all of your sins and then put your faith in Christ and you can be saved is heresy. It's a fundamentalist heresy and it is a salvation by works. The truth is you don't know all of your sins when you get saved. And God sends His Holy Spirit to point out your sins to you after you're saved and to cleanse you after you're saved. But at the moment of salvation, you've got to repent from one sin and that's the sin of unbelief. And brother, when you turn around and say, Jesus, I have received the gift of eternal life, you repented of that sin of unbelief, and then God sends His Holy Spirit to clean you up. So whenever you say that to people, here's what they'll say. Well, I'm not saying that you have to stop sinning altogether. And then we enter just this major gray area. You know what I mean? Because people say, hey, if you, if you want to be saved... You know, you have to repent of your sins. And, you know, if you're still living the same way, you're not really saved. And there needs to be a change. And you need to live right and everything. But then it's like, but then you say to people like, wait a minute, are you saying that, that you're just going to totally stop sinning? Well, not totally. 
You know, it's like, well, you just have to kind of try. Yeah. Well, there has to be some change. No, somehow, okay. you know, repentance and faith are inseparable graces. This is why they teach a works-based salvation. Because they actually believe this sentence. So if you're not living right, well, you haven't been struck with that inseparable, you know, that inseparable grace of repentance and faith. I just talked to one of these losers who out soul winning recently. He says, look, you can't just be living however you want and be saved. Well, actually you can. It's called faith. It's called faith alone. I don't believe that. I don't think you can be, you know, smoking crack and be saved or whatever. Why? Because they believe repentance is the faith. Yeah, there's little need to document this side of the new IFB movement. It is one of the tenets of their faith that repentance from sin is not part of the gospel. Uh, now, I've gotten into that in other videos, which is where I pulled some of these videos, uh, but that's not the main issue. Uh, the main issue here is, was that what the fundamentals taught? The original fundamentals of the faith, did that include repentance from sin? Now, there's a chapter in the fundamentals by evangelist L.W. Munhall. Uh, where he's talking about conversion. It says the doctrines that must be emphasized in successful evangelism. Uh, and uh, he says this, conversion means to turn about or upon. When the unsaved sinner is convinced of sin and resolves to turn from his transgressions and commit his ways unto the Lord, he has repented. And when he acts upon that resolve and yields himself to God in absolute self-surrender, he is converted. Now there, this is something that all men who contributed to the fundamentals uh, believed, regardless of their backgrounds. They believed that repentance was defined not only as a change of mind, a change of belief, but a turning from sin. Uh, this is expressed in the old IFB uh, with uh, John R. Rice. John R. Rice has stated, to repent literally means to have a change of mind or spirit toward God and toward sin. It means to turn from your sins earnestly with all your heart and trust in Jesus Christ to save you. You can see then how the man who believes in Christ repents and the man who repents believes in Christ. The jailer repented when he turned from his sin to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's from his book, What Must I Do to Be Saved, his booklet. Also, Lester Roloff, as we've already mentioned, had this to say about repentance. Repentance is a godly sorrow for sin. Repentance is a forsaking of sin. Real repentance is putting your trust in Jesus Christ so you will not live like that anymore. Repentance is permanent. It is a lifelong and eternity-long experience. You will never love the devil again once you repent. You will never flirt with the devil as the habit of your life again once you, are, once you get saved. You will never be happy living in sin. You will never... It will never satisfy, and the husk of the world will never fill your longing and hungering in your soul. Repentance is something a lot bigger than a, a lot of people think. It is absolutely essential if you go to heaven. Uh, that's Lester Roloff. Uh, so you see the old-time fundamentals of the faith, the, what is the basis of fundamentalism itself, believed in the concept of repentance from sin. Now, the whole idea, uh, the absurdity that Anderson and others try to po point out, well, you, don't, you, you can't know all your sins. No, no, obviously you don't know all of your sins. David talked about secret sins, sins that you don't even know you commit because you, of your ignorance. We repent of those as well. We repent of sin as a whole in general. We, we abhor sin. We want to turn from sin. Uh, that's what it means to repent. Is if sin is thrown at us, we want we are disgusted by it. Uh, so there is a an actual change of heart and attitude towards sin, and that was preached in old fundamentalism. This new doctrine that uh, Anderson and others are preaching in the new IFB distinguishes them from actual fundamentalism. We'll get into more into that as we move along.